。中美关系如何重返正轨 ？U.S. is gearing itself up to compete、uh, as strongly as it can in those particular areas. Over time, moderation in the trading relationship and probably in、uh, FDI going both ways. 中国经济复苏，发展机遇全球共享。What is the path that the Chinese economy is going to be on、uh, over the next、uh, few years with the new leadership which has come into place? 风云对话专访哈佛大学肯尼迪政府学院教授托尼·塞奇。美方所谓要给中美关系加装护栏，不发生冲突，实际上就是要中国打不还手，骂不还口。但这办不到。如果美方不踩刹车，继续沿着错误的道路狂飙下去，再多的护栏也挡不住脱轨翻车，陷入对抗冲突。谁来承担其灾难性的后果？三月七日，中国外交部长秦刚在两会记者会上谈及中美关系时表示，决定中美关系的应该是两国的共同利益。共同责任和两国人民的友谊，而不是美国的国内政治和歇斯底里的新麦卡锡主义。近年来，美国国内反华、恐华情绪日益高涨，严重干扰和损害中美关系正常发展，而且这种局面有向更危险方向发展的趋势。美国总统拜登在二月七日的国情咨文演说中多次提及中国，渲染两国竞争，在诸如半导体、通货膨胀、阿片危机等美国国内议题中渲染中国因素。摩擦频现，中美关系能否重返正轨？哈佛大学肯尼迪学院教授托尼·塞奇做客《风云对话》，就近期热点话题做出了分析和预测。Good morning, Professor Sage. It's great to have you on Talk with World Leaders. Thank you very much for the invitation. On February 7th, U.S. President Joe Biden delivered his annual State of the Union address, focusing on the U.S. economy and other domestic affairs. And President Biden said the U.S. is in the strongest position in decades to compete with China, and China came up several times in the address. How do you understand? This policy of competition. Well, there's certainly plenty of hot spots、uh, in the relationship at the moment. I think that、um, what the U.S. is alluding to is that it really wants to stay the dominant power for those industries that are going to dominate technology into the 21st century, and that's why we've seen、uh, the increased investments that the U.S. is making into key areas around things like semi.、Uh, Uh, chip and computer、uh, production, and I think it sees、um, supercomputers, AI,、uh, quantum informatics, biotechnology, really as the dominant、um, technologies that will decide our future, and will relate to which power has、uh, the most influence globally. And I think what the U.S. has been worried about is that the Chinese investments in those areas have also been considerable. And it fears that one of the plays that China is making is to become dominant in those industries as a way of enhancing its global power. And so I think、uh, the U.S. is gearing itself up to compete、uh, as strongly as it can in those particular areas. So that's where I think it talks about competing, but of course it also talks about cooperating in those areas where it can. What do you think American companies in China? Can do in order to play a bridging role. You mentioned、uh, there are areas where the two countries can cooperate in. Yeah, I think it's going to be a very difficult terrain for U.S. businesses to navigate, because you're going to have increasing pressures coming out of Washington,、uh, potential sanctions, areas that Washington does not want U.S. business to be involved in. So I think for U.S. companies, it's finding that, that sort of Sweet spot, if you like,、uh, between what the U.S. won't allow <clears throat> and what China wants to encourage, and I think、uh, we do see there's areas where China is open still to U.S. engagement. We've seen, for example, Tesla being allowed 100%、uh, operating capacity in China. We've seen the opening to Wall Street because China desperately needs
access to global financial markets. But having said that, I think we also have to look at reality. Despite the rhetoric on both sides, US-China trade uh, rose to its highest level in 2022. Absolutely, so despite I think this, the pandemic. Despite this pandemic and despite all these uh, frictions in the relationship. And I think that tells you a lot that, uh, you know, in a way, US companies are not really US in the sense that they're global operators trying to make a profit. So until they're clearly told don't, they're going to keep trying to find ways to invest uh, in China. And I think that's going to create fr frictions both with Beijing, but I think it's also going to create frictions between some of the businesses and, for example, Wall Street and the policies that uh, Washington and the White House would like to pursue. Sure. Uh, Professor Sage, you mentioned uh, competition. You mentioned uh, the fields of technology in particular. In the State of Union, uh, which talked a lot about the Science and Chips Act of 2022, and this act, we all know, was signed in order to, to bolster U.S. semiconductor capacity. And this act uh, says that uh, American companies should not be making precision chips in China, for example. I mean, is this the, the sort of competition that we want? What is healthy competition? Well, I think healthy competition is where there would be a level playing field on both sides. I think that would mean, uh, you know, both Washington and Beijing coming to some kind of agreement about what is uh, a fair basis for investment in both countries. And of course, we see the complaints on both sides about state support uh, to core industries, which disturb that level playing field. So in that sense, uh, healthy uh, is not the word one would use for the competition. It's certainly a rigged competition on both sides to try and support uh, <clears throat> as best they can their own uh, domestic uh, enterprises and industries that they see as key uh, for future development. And to be honest, I see it very difficult uh, about how you would roll back from the current situation. I think given the tension within the relationships, given the fact that both countries now see themselves in a struggle for dominance in those key industries, <clears throat> it seems to me highly unlikely that uh, either country is going to push back. And I think what we'll see is, um, you know, over time, moderation in the trading relationship and probably in uh, FDI going both ways. I mean, it's clear that uh, Chinese FDI into uh, the US, for example, has dropped dramatically since the peak of 2016, 2017. But of course, a lot of that was driven by private enterprises, not by state organizations. So I don't really see a healthy competition uh, as a future trend. 当地时间二月十八日，应美方请求，中共中央政治局委员、中央外事工作委员会办公室主任王毅出席慕尼黑安全会议期间，同美国国务卿布林肯非正式接触。这也是气球事件发生后中美高层官员的首次接触。王毅强调，如果美方在所谓“飞艇”事件上执意借题发挥、炒作升级、扩大事态，中方必将奉陪到底，一切后果将由美方承担。虽然中美在这次穆安会没有就增加两国间对话机制达成任何正式协议，但依然被看作是为缓和两国关系所做出的努力。根据美国媒体的分析报道，美国情报官员正在评估气球因强风而偏离方向、误入美国的可能性，而这或将是缓和两国紧张关系的关键。Regarding the latest balloon incidents in the relations, how do you think this is going to play out? Well, it came at an extraordinarily unfortunate time uh, when. Uh... Secretary Blinken, of course, was going to go to Beijing and by all accounts may well have met with uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping. And of course, that might have marked a reset for the relationship. But now the incident is really playing into those on both sides that want to uh, create problems. As you well know, in Washington, there's really very few things that unite Republicans and Democrats. And one of them is an increasing uh, concern about China's development and what it sees as China's rise. And this has really played in. It's going to be stoked further, of course, by Speaker McCarthy's visit to Taiwan later in the year. 
And so we're really looking at a very sort of unsteady uh, period where things will escalate. I think both sides would like to set this aside so that they can get back at least to some level of speaking with one another. But it's difficult given the domestic politics within China and the domestic politics within the US uh, to move back swiftly from that. You mentioned the McCarthy potential visit to Taiwan. How likely do you think this would happen? Well, I think it's very likely. I mean, I, I don't think any self-respecting Republican politician is going to turn around and say, no, 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 to protect the relationship, I'm not going to Taiwan. I mean, I think he would be heavily criticized by members of his own party. I suspect it will be the first of a series of meetings uh, to Taiwan, which of course, again, is going to throw uh, friction into that situation. Back in 2021, uh, there was an online meeting between our president, uh, President Xi Jinping, and US President Joe Biden. President Biden proposed guardrails for the US-China relationship. What do you think are these so-called guardrails? Do you think they have been established? Well, they certainly haven't been established. So this is a huge problem in the relationship. I mean, if you think back, even at the height of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, there were mechanisms, there were guardrails in place to stop um, tensions, potential conflicts in the relationship spinning out of control. And I think that's where the fear comes in currently that we don't have sufficient trust that those guardrails can be built, that if another incident, like the EP3 incident, for example, back in 2001, uh, or uh, the recent balloon incident, that there is a mechanism uh, to communicate to stop the situation escalating. Now, <clears throat> my understanding is that from the Chinese side, they have concerns about guardrails. You know, what do you mean by guardrails? So again, I think we go back to this uh, basic point that without a modicum of trust and a basic level of trust, it's hard for either side really to move forward to establish what I think most people would see as uh, necessary lines of communication and necessary ways to um, uh, manage the relationship. Professor Sage, you mentioned uh, trust. It's very important to re-establish trust in order for the two sides to have a better relationship. What areas do you think the two countries can cooperate in in order to restore mutual trust? Well, we do know that the one area where both sides seem to have signaled cooperation is that of climate change, which of course is important to the whole world, which ironically is a reverse of the way that uh, both countries look at this a few years ago. If I look at it, um, I would say that there's different categories of what I would call you know, global public goods, which both sides are going to benefit from, and indeed other countries are going to benefit from. And I would divide that into three different categories. First of all, what I would call the global commons. And already we do see serious attempts to try and push forward on climate change. I think it extends to questions of fisheries, water shortages, for example. Then I think there's a category of global engagement uh, where the two countries could operate, starting from a low level, try and build up trust around, for example, natural disasters with cooperation. Both countries have significant experience in dealing with natural disasters. Peacekeeping operations, for example. And despite what has been happening with COVID, fighting infectious diseases. We know that both countries cooperated very well, for example, with the outbreak of Ebola uh, previously in Africa. Eventually, they cooperated extremely well back in 2002, 2003 around SARS. So it's not impossible. And then last is the very important area of global regulation, which is extremely important. Finance, trade regulations, cybersecurity. I think you'd have to set aside the military aspect of cybersecurity, but I think on some of the civilian side, uh, those are areas where low-key uh, cooperations could start. I think all of these areas you mentioned are very reasonable and uh, really the two sides should be able to see this. And I think one element you mentioned that's missing is trust. And in order to build trust or rebuild trust, the two sides really need to talk to each other.
托尼·塞奇是哈佛大学肯尼迪政府学院大宇国际事务教授，著名中国问题专家。他为中国乃至亚洲多个国家及地区的政府部门、私营机构和非营利组织及国际机构担任高级顾问，包括发起并负责哈佛大学中国高级官员培训项目，并长期从事中国政治经济与公共政策问题研究。托尼·塞奇与中国的渊源要追溯到一九七六年，那一年，伦敦大学硕士生塞奇从香港步行过罗湖桥来到深圳。三十年过去，中国已经今非昔比，而塞奇依然感慨：这个国家，永远让我感到惊奇。Professor Sage, you're an expert on China and、uh, the CCP. Why do you think the West misunderstands China? Where I do think there is misunderstanding is at two different aspects, and the first is that I think because we now have much less access to Chinese society than we had before, we tend to rely on what elites are saying and the actions of elites in China, and I think that obscures the、um, the dynamism of Chinese society and the huge variety of experiences that exist. Within Chinese society, and I think that is misleading. That we tend to get a picture painted of it being a homogenous society, society all moving in the same direction, whereas all of us know that the society is very complex, very different emotions, very different ideals, very different ideas. And I think if we could paint a bit more of that complexity of that picture, it would be helpful. 自1976年以英国学生身份首度访华，塞奇几乎每年都会到访中国。一直以来，他将中国发展作为重要研究领域之一。十年前，塞奇启动了一个中国公共政策与政府创新案例研究项目，针对中国改革开放和经济社会转型中不同领域的政策现象展开调研，其中就包括他本人的重要研究课题之一。中国城市化问题，塞奇曾说：“想要正确看待中国这个日益强大的国家，就需要首先了解中国的发展路径。” Uh, this urbanisation is going to provide sufficient impetus for China's economic growth over the next ten years. And now, ten years later, how do you view your judgment at that time? Well, I think it's probably one of the few of my judgments that turned out to be reasonably accurate. I mean, there's no doubt that、uh, it's provided、uh, a huge stimulus into uh, growth uh, within China. The expansion uh, of infrastructure, uh, the creation of larger cities, the networking between cities, the investment that went into educational infrastructure in those cities. I mean, China, in a way, is still under-urbanized for its level of economic development,、uh, but that doesn't mean there haven't been problems、uh, with urbanization and, and challenges for urbanization moving forward.、Um, Chinese cities, even though we feel they're very compact and dense. Are actually less dense than many other large cities around the world, and that has to do a lot with the way that land is controlled and sold within China. You tend to get a lot of urban sprawl rather than urban concentration, and that will be a problem moving forward as China begins to run out of land that can be converted for future urban、uh, growth. I think a second、uh, challenge. That has not been resolved through this phase of urbanization is the integration of migrant workers and those moving from the countryside into the cities, and that again is a challenge China is going to have to to deal with. You don't want millions or tens of millions of disaffected citizens who feel, though, even though they've benefited from the urbanization, they are to a large extent locked out from the benefits of education and healthcare. That can be provided in the urban areas. So urbanization has brought a lot of progress, a lot of success、uh, to China. But 
you know, China is now dealing, if you like, with the fruits of its success. Uh, one more question uh, about your role at Harvard Kennedy School. You oversaw the training courses for uh, senior Chinese government officials uh, coming to study or uh, for training at Harvard University. You have lectured uh, many uh, senior Chinese officials. In your opinion, what characters uh, do you think these officials have in common? Um, I think the characteristics were they were very smart, generally pretty well educated, and I would say thirdly, very inquisitive about the world outside. You know, one of the purposes of those training programs was not to persuade them that was a good way to go about governing or dealing with infrastructure, but was to provide them with views of what, what is happening in other parts of the world. So a lot of the examples we used for in, in the program were not necessarily from the United States or America. We just tended to pick best practices. And then it was up to them whether they wanted to, to use those, those skills or not. They were very uh, engaged, I would say, in the training program. I think they benefited from it. I would say one of the biggest advantages of the program was not them interacting with us, but them interacting with one another. I actually found it fascinating that they really learned from one another's experiences. So, and I know that they've kept those connections when they've gone back, that um, often when they visited another province, one of the first things they have done is contact whoever was in the program with them from that area. So I think it was a great experience, not just for them, but going back to a question you raised earlier about misunderstandings, it was a fantastic opportunity for them to put forward China's views uh, in the classroom. And they certainly did. I mean, they were very strong in their views about what worked, what didn't work in China. And I think particularly for my colleagues who don't work closely on China, I think it was wonderful for them to have the opportunity to hear those views directly from colleagues uh, uh, who came from China. And again, I think it's a pity that that kind of avenue for uh, two-way communication uh, doesn't exist uh, currently. How do you think the officials have changed today compared to before when you used to have these training courses? Well, again, I, I mean, I did uh, carry on teaching at the uh, Shanghai Party School up until COVID. So that was a week in what is called their Zhongqing Ban. And um, so I, that, of course, was just Shanghai, not, you know, colleagues from around the rest of China. I would say little has changed. I mean, as you know, the, the Shanghai officials are extremely competent and extremely well qualified, very challenging. And I suppose if one difference, uh, and not surprisingly so, uh, more assertive about the values of what they were developing themselves in China. And one of the great things of doing that program in Shanghai was that we actually asked them to present their cases about what they felt had been successful in terms of urban management. And there were some good learning lessons there, uh, I would say, for, for us and for anybody who wanted to participate in that. So in some ways, perhaps that uh, confidence uh, was stronger, certainly stronger than when we began the program in 2003, where it was much more, you know, you tell us, you tell us, as much more now, no, we want to exchange with you. We also want to tell us, tell you our experiences and what we think has worked. Great, Professor Sage. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to have you with us today. Are you going to be visiting Beijing or Shanghai anytime soon? I hope so at some point. Um, this year is already looking a bit full, but uh, maybe towards the end of the year, I'll get a chance to, to go and meet again with our colleagues and our friends. Uh, I'll be looking forward to it. It's, uh, it's been a long time since I've been able to go to China because of COVID. Of course, I've kept uh, contacts online. I've done some online seminars and discussions with uh, colleagues and some track two dialogues uh, with colleagues from China. But uh, as you know well, it's not the same thing. When you're in the same room, you see those other indications that you can't really see over Zoom and you can have some of the more informal conversations, which I often think for both sides are perhaps the most valuable uh, conversations. <laughs>
接着为您播出《五粮液时事直通车》。